everyone. Welcome back to the Weekend Ball podcast. I am Alex Adams, live here in Jakarta, Indonesia, covering Team Canada at the FIBA World Cup. Um, obviously, Canada, for, for everyone that knows, is, is 3-0, and with just absolutely uh, crushing France and Latvia, and obviously Lebanon as well. Um, to de- discuss this all, I am joined by Josh Lewenberg of TSN, who's covered the Raptors for a long time, and Canada basketball. Josh, thanks so much for, for taking the time and doing this. I'm always happy to take a break from changing diapers and my fantasy football prep to talk ball. So thanks for having me. Um, that's funny. What Have you made your fantasy football lineup and everything? Have you done the draft? I haven't done the drafts. I have my first tomorrow and then a couple next week. So I'm going through. I have a process here every year, like make my list. And then I like to map out like ADP, who's going where. So I know like who I want to reach mm-hmm. on and, and whatnot. It, it's a bit of a process. Is but it like I, an odd? Is it an auction league or what is it? No, it's, it's draft. Yeah, okay. Okay. Interesting. I always hear auctions like the way people like the hardcores do it, but I, I'm not a, a fantasy fo- football guy. People love it, but the auction is intense. That's like a three to four hour endeavor. <laughs> and unlike like the regular draft, you can sort of take breaks and go for a snack or whatever in between your picks, bathroom breaks. But the auction, you have got to be locked in for like three hours straight. Yeah. I, I don't have I yeah and with the with the with the kid on like there that i don't know if you have all my hours. patience is going towards fatherhood right now not yeah. the auction yeah. drafts and how's how's your kid by the way just all things are good he's doing great I, i'm okay. i'm happy that he's being raised at a time in a world where canada basketball <laughs> being a canadian basketball fan hopefully he's a canadian basketball fan if he starts like getting into soccer or hockey or anything i'm gonna call an audible on that real yeah. quick but the fact that he's growing up here at a time where basketball is as popular as it is now, let's just say it wasn't that way when I was growing up. So that's, that's a cool thing. Just with that, what was your first, when were you first introduced to the Canadian men's basketball team, Josh? Well, like basketball in general, um, when the Raptors came into existence in 95, I would have been like eight years old mm-hmm. at the time. And like, not only did that introduced me to basketball, but like that, introduced me to to sports i wasn't a sports fan at all mm. uh but my dad has always been really into basketball we're, we're bad canadians in that way i guess because <laughs> no, no. i like i was never into hockey my dad was never into hockey so uh he, he would take me to raptors games very early on and i became a damon stoudemire fan we're mm. not tall people either in my family so like seeing mighty mouse do his thing um was awesome and yeah, from there, I, I've just loved basketball ever since. And as I said, just like the growth of basketball in this country in, in such a like short amount of time, too. I mean, obviously, you can you can take it back a long time, go back to 95 after it came to be or like the Vince Carter years, obviously. But specifically over the last 10 years, just like seeing the rise and just like going around the city and from like kids playing on the like the little hockey mm-hmm. nets on the street. Like you don't see that as much anymore. Whereas every other house has a basketball a yeah. outside. So yeah, that's that's been really cool. And obviously the Raptors and their success have had a lot to do with that. But now seeing the likes of Shea Gilgis Alexander and Jamal Murray, Jamal Murray winning a championship, Andrew Wiggins winning a championship a few years ago, I'm sure that's gone a long way too. Yeah, for sure. And and for you, Josh, obviously we were talking about this off just off air that you covered the 2015 team and obviously uh, I still see the Dominican coach, uh, Che Garcia. I think that's his name yeah. um, who just, his smile just gives me chills and uh, just, yeah, there, there, his smiles in my nightmares, but what transformation that whole trip is in my nightmares. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, what, what transformation or how would you compare that team in 2015? That was probably the closest to making the Olympics, I guess you can talk about 21 too, but um, to compare to this team right now in, in Jakarta. It's like eerie a little bit. And that's why like people are excited right now and they should be excited right now. And and I want to be too. And I sort of am, but there is that like voice in the back of my head that says like, hold up because we've seen things like this before. I want to, at some point we're going to get into why I feel confident that this team is different than those teams that Mm -hmm. came up short before, because I I do think that it is. 
but yeah, I mean, like, I, I will never forget that trip, first of all, because to this day, that's the longest I've ever been away for work a month in. It was Puerto Rico and then Mexico City for the uh, FIBA Americas. And there was a ton of excitement, like very similar vibes and discourse to what we're talking about now, where it's like the most talented Canadian team ever. That was, I think it was nine NBA players. So more than this team has led by Andrew Wiggins. And at the time, like Wiggins agreeing to play was a huge deal. And they like destroyed the first like seven or eight teams that they played in that tournament. Like not even close. We were, they beat one team by 40. Mm -hmm. They were winning games by 30. And then, yeah, after a, a month of, of that grind, the one game that they needed to win against Venezuela, they come up short by one point. And I'm sure you remember heartbreaking, mm. embarrassing fashion. And then like Victoria on home soil in overtime, like a pretty similar result. So that's why like people that know the history of this program mm -hmm. know yeah. how it's happened and what's happened. Um, this tournament is a little bit different. I think like when we're talking about differences, that's the first thing is like there, there isn't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily matter how you finish in the tournament. Right. So long as at least if we're talking about Olympic qualifying, so long as you outlast all but one of those teams in the Americas. So in that sense, there's not going to be that like win and you're in losing your out type of game. Like there was in Mexico city or Victoria, unless somehow they end up facing one of those Americas teams in like, the semis or in the qualification games, seeding games, whatever they call it. Um, but at some point you're going to get to those stages where there must wins, not the very important games that they played so far. Cause they have been important. Like that win over France, the win over Latvia was really, really important, but there's a difference obviously between a very mm -hmm. important game and a literal must win game. So like, that's what they're going to be judged on. Obviously like, in yeah. a month from now, we're not going to be thinking about or talking about or caring about what they did in the first round or the second round. It's going to come down to the end. That's what they're going to be judged on. So, like, I feel good about this team because I do think they're different. But is, is it what, what's some of the history too? What what is the skepticism or, or not the skepticism, but maybe just the pause no, no, or concern? Is it more the history and just the fact that? Let's once they get to the quarterfinals, it's one game and they're going to be playing a pretty good team as well. It's not they don't have an easy draw um, the rest of the way other than maybe the, their next game against Brazil. Yeah, I, I mean, those are those are both good points. And I think like the history, while that is in the back of my mind and a lot of people's minds, it is kind of silly in a way, too. Right. Because and we talk about that all the time with like in sports, you have those like stats like mm -hmm. this team hasn't made the playoff Sacramento Kings. Yeah, the Kings haven't made the playoffs in. 20 years almost a decade whatever it is it's like those were different teams it does i think when when the players hear something like that i do think there is like a a, a philosophical thing that happens where you're like kind of bogged down by the history of a franchise or something where it does get in players minds but for the most part it's like okay well and and the raptors were hearing that for a long time too mm -hmm. when they couldn't win around but it's like those teams like DeMar DeRozan teams, Kyle Lowry teams, like that wasn't on them. That was on mm -hmm. Arnani and like those other. <laughs> so yeah. I, th there are, there is some overlap here with those teams Kelly Olynyk and a few of the other guys have been playing for a long time, but like you think Shea cares about no. this program's failures in the past. So I do think the history element of it is a little bit silly. I agree with you. I think like the bigger, reason for pause and it's not even specific to Canada but I think for any country to feel like super overconfident in a tournament like this it's just the nature and the structure of these FIBA tournaments it's almost like March Madness right like these aren't seven game series where mm -hmm. more often than not the better more talented team is going to win in, in a one game playoff situation knockout rounds which are coming anything can happen one bad game one rough shooting night um and and these things can happen as we've seen before for Canada so yeah a, a little bit of skepticism but again we're going to talk about why this team is different and I do feel that they are and 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 for you like what level of confidence does a guy like Shea Gildas Alexander give to this team and maybe just to you and how you see the outlook of this team because you 
I mean, since Steve Nash, I would argue they haven't had any player really close to the level of Shea. And, and you you see him in these third quarters and in these games just absolutely dominate um, that uh, Canada really hasn't had when they failed in Mexico or in Victoria. Yeah, with all due respect to Andrew Wiggins, and like I said, there was a ton of excitement when Wiggins had agreed to play, but like he was nowhere close to being at this level. And I mean, even Steve Nash, like he was – really really good he was an all-star player when he was playing for Canada I think at the time he was just coming off of a couple of third team all NBA selections but he wasn't quite the MVP version of Steve Nash Mm -hmm. yet he wasn't the Phoenix version of Steve Nash yet um so I think like at the height of Shea's powers right now he might be in the moment the best player to to play for Canada Corey Joseph kind of sort of tried to make that point also mm-hmm. in training camp yeah, I remember and that. He realized what he was saying it was like yeah. you could see the wheels turning in his head like oh shoot like yeah, he said that too he's like oh I don't know don't no tell Steve I said Nash. this yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's probably afraid it's gonna end up in so on social media in like five minutes which it probably did yeah um but yeah I think so wh- why is this team different or or why could this team be different than those teams that couldn't get over the hump in the past like that that's the biggest reason is they they are led by an all world caliber superstar and mm-hmm. like that that goes a long way in these tournaments as we've seen like that can literally win you games and i mean maybe they end up going on and and coming back against France and Latvia, even without Shea, but like those are, those would have been really, really, really tight games. And instead like Canada gets off to the slow start in both games. Shea completely takes over in the third quarter and what looked like they could be upsets or at the very least tight finishes end up turning into blowouts. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the Shea factor. There, There are other factors as well, obviously, but that's the Shea factor. So I would say like, why are they different? There's that. And then the other thing is like credit to the program because they've learned from mistakes of the past. They've come short repeatedly because it wasn't for a lack of talent, at least in those, those examples that we talked about earlier, it was for a lack of chemistry and continuity. So, and we talked a lot about this. Everyone did last year. So much was made of like the three-year commitment and the fact Mm -hmm. that they got guys to actually do that and listen, it's going to – I'm not sure if that was the right move. Like, I think, at least in the execution of it, and I hate to be mm-hmm. results-based in my thinking, but I think it's going to come down to how it ends up turning yeah. out, right? Like, if a few of these guys get hurt and Lou Dort is already dealing with something, or if they – come up short in the end I think maybe we look back and say well well, maybe they could have used some of these NBA guys that they turned away um this summer in the interest of keeping their summer core together but if nothing else like I'm going to give Canada credit for what's the saying like the definition of insanity is (laughs) yeah doing the same thing over and over the same thing over and over again and expecting different results so they've tried something different they stuck to their guns too, right? Like it would have been very easy for them to say like, this is what we're doing. And then I don't think it was Andrew Wiggins. Yeah. And that's going to be a, that's going to be another thing altogether. If they make the Olympics and then all of a sudden you've got yeah. guys like Andrew Wiggins going next summer, then we're going to see if they really stick to it. But we know for sure it was at least Leonard Miller, right? So for mm-hmm. Leonard Miller to come calling and you to say, well, actually we're, we're good. Like that, that takes some, some yeah. cojones, right? So like, I, Good I on do, them. Mm-hmm. Go yeah, ahead. No, I I do think that what's interesting with that and your what you're talking about, guys coming. Obviously, Jamal didn't come. Andrew Wiggins, I feel as though probably wouldn't just because he missed some of the the season just with Golden State with personal matters. And um, I he's always talked about going to the Olympics, and and I believe if Canada makes it, he's gonna call Rowan Barrett and say, "Hey, uh, where's my spot?" <laughs> but with guys like Leonard Miller or Ben Matherin or Shaden Sharp, who all or Andrew Nemhart, maybe a bit different with Nemhart because he has played for Canada. Like he was in 2019 as a 18, 19 year old at the FIBA World Cup. But those guys are pretty young, right? And and you you saw it live in 2015 how Canada and I think their oldest players were like 23, 24 out of like the NBA core essentially. And um just seeing them in a FIBA environment, I don't know how they'd react 
right? Especially with limited playing time, because most of this team is young, but has four or five years of NBA experience. So um, I, I I agree with the the three year commitment. I wonder if it really changed anything in a weird way in terms of the guys that came, other than maybe a Miller or maybe I don't know Matherin. But um, it's also hard to. I was you know talking like some of the problems just with the younger guys too coming up is insurance with the NBA, right? Um, their their contracts are only insured for their value right now. But if you're shade and sharp and in two years you want a big max extension um you're and you blow out your acl and that goes away you're not insured for that max extension you're insured for whatever you're making now so um it's really interesting but i think your point's a good one is like turning guys away right like a leonard miller might make a lot of sense on this roster Um, it wasn't a no-brainer but i i think honestly it's paying off because we're seeing we're seeing the fruits of, of that labor of the time that this group has spent together training obviously last summer but even just like in the lead up to this too because that's another big difference in the past they've been so thankful to have nba guys committing in the past (laughs) they're like all right you show up whenever you want want. you can meet guys on the plane get to know your teammates on the plane on the way to whatever tournament we're going to they've done that in the past whereas this time it's like you're committing six weeks you're playing not just exhibition games friendlies but like high level against like really good teams as we saw with Germany Mm -hmm. and with Spain. And I think that experience in terms of building the continuity and the chemistry, that was really important too. So I think like in addition to the, the Shea factor, having this really tight knit group that clearly, and you, you can speak to it way more than I can, but just being just, just watching this team from the outside, looking in, seeing the, the closeness and the togetherness. I'm not sure that, that, it was to that level in 2015 or even in 2021. No, for sure. I mean, you watch them at, at like, you know, after practice and everyone's dancing and singing and they, they look really happy together. Like they look very close now. Uh, mind you, Josh, I don't have your experience of seeing a bunch of Raptors teams together and, uh, I don't know if they always look like they're singing Kumbaya. I can I, tell you the vibes weren't like that last season. Nobody was dancing. And yeah, singing I, I think I think that's the case with the Raptors last year. So just watching them, it looks like a really happy group. And obviously Shea's the leader of the team. And him and Nikhil are always together doing stuff, which obviously brings, you know, their togetherness. And if you ask guys, right, like Kelly's grown up with Dwight Powell. You can see that in their two-man game. RJ's kind of grew, grew up with with Shea they went to 2016 in Manila um and Lou Dort obviously plays with Shea um Dylan Brooks a bit maybe a bit more of an outsider in a way but um he's been honestly my standout in terms of I just did not expect the way he's been playing does I don't think he's taken one bad shot this whole tournament really and if you look at what his shot profile was with uh, Memphis it was the exact opposite so he's really bought in and um, the team looks really together and they keep talking about how they've known each other for years, which is not what you really tend to hear with Canada teams. It's like, oh, like I know him like, oh, he's from the GTA. I, I, yeah, right? I, met, I met him last week. Yeah, exactly. And that's not really the case. Like even Melvin Edgem yeah. talked about how well he he remembers RJ as a little kid. And, at, you know, I think in 2015 or, or something like that. And um, it really makes just... a huge difference because like that, that's why they were losing. Mm -hmm. 2015 to venezuela 2021 to what was it czech republic like those teams i think czech republic had one nba player venezuela didn't have any they had a fraction of the talent that canada had but like the difference and this is what i was saying earlier in terms of like learning from what went wrong those teams had been playing together forever like yeah. and obviously because they weren't NBA players, like they were they were playing together during the year too. So it's like, how do you how do you get around that? How do you get mm-hmm. around the fact that if you're Canada or the US and you have NBA guys who like aren't playing together year round, how do you get around that? And the fact that Canada has sort of found that way to do that by finding guys that have just known each other a really long time and played together for a really long time and have that kind of already like pre-built mm-hmm. chemistry and continuity. I, I think it's worked out really well, whether that was their intention or not. Like you said, there's just so many connections on this team. Yeah. And what's interesting just with the three min- three year commitment to go back to that, right? Like Kelly, Dwight, Shea, Nikhil, they're all together last year. And then they also asked 
the NBA guys like Jamal or or RJ who weren't there last summer um, to to come to camp, right? So they're it's still even a, like around each other, which I think was a really smart move at the time by Nick Nurse and Rowan Barrett. And so um, you can just really see the fruits of that labor, and um, it's it's been really fun to watch. And uh, what's interesting, I don't know, I just watching the pre tournament games, they did not feel this connected on the court as much, and just the way they've looked here in in Jakarta has just been amazing I do think some of that I, I want to know what you think is that they're just playing their NBA players all the minutes essentially with you know sparse little um, kind of uh, cameos by guys like Melvin Edgem who's been really good just for how he's been playing um, Kyle Alexander here and there but not really and they're playing Kelly at the five so what do you make of just to, to transition a little bit to, to Jordy Fernandez's job that he's done and, and how you've seen the way he's been playing the guys here in Jakarta well, that, that was my question going into the tournament, in addition to the rotation stuff, because I agree, we, we saw a lot of different things in those exhibition games, and like, rightly so, right? Like, mm-hmm. that's Jordy's opportunity to experiment and to to see what works and what doesn't work. But in addition to that, it's like, we, we heard a lot in camp and throughout the exhibition about defense being this team's calling mm-hmm. card, and that was going to be their identity. And we didn't see a ton of it in the exhibition. Like the second game. half against Spain yeah. was, was great. But outside of that, and as good as Canada looked in, like they, they played well in those comebacks, the Germany game that they won. But like it wasn't because their defense was exceptional by any means. Mm. So there was that like question about like, okay, well, like can <laughs> they be what they think they are, that they want to be? But their defense has been incredible so far in this tournament. So, like, it, going back to all of those reasons why we're optimistic about how this team can finish, like, if they're shutting teams down in the way that they have been, understanding, again, that, like, all of these games are important. Soon they're going to be really, really important. But, like, hmm. even the Lebanon game, like, they were favored in that game by a lot. Um, but I think it would have been pretty easy to just come – out and go Mm. through the motions and I think a lot of teams in that situation probably do that and just kind of coast a little bit but they they didn't from start to finish that was like as dominant as a a dominant as uh, as dominant an offensive performance as I've seen so I think that's what I've really liked so far is that I feel like they've been tested in different ways in each of the three games and Mm -hmm. they passed all three tests and they've they've looked great defensively doing pretty I mean with, with the exception of a few stretches here and there, but yeah, that, that's like, been, mm-hmm. sorry, go ahead. No, just like even in the, uh, the Latvia game and the crowd was crazy. Um, it felt as though just, it, I mean, the players talked about how it felt like a road game or even a playoff game just with the, the Latvian fans. But I mean, there were defensive lapses, but Latvia was just hitting a bunch of tough shots at the same time. It wasn't just a complete, um, if anything, it was Canada on offense that was just as poor, right? And they weathered the storm. And it's been really interesting to see just how this team can seemingly in these third quarters just turn the switch and dial up their defense and their offense too. And um, I I really have been just really impressed with Dylan Brooks on on defense. And, and Lou Dort too in the first game, obviously he's been out for precautionary reasons. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that just a little bit, but He's been phenomenal and he just all over the place and especially against teams where they might not have the athletes as Canada, right? Like the NBA type athletes, when you put Dylan Brooks on, you know, some of these European point guards that aren't used to a six, eight monster pestering you all around the court. It's uh, it's been really fun to watch. What player maybe has stood out for you, Josh, so far in this tournament that isn't maybe Shea or, or like an obvious answer. Um. Well, in terms of like the non-obvious answers, like you mentioned Edgem earlier, I, I've been pretty impressed with all of the non-NBA guys coming off the bench, like w- within their role, right? Because like you're not asking, you're not expecting a ton from those guys because you're not asking for a ton from those guys, mm-hmm. but you've needed them here and there. Obviously, we saw more of them in the Lebanon game and, and that was sort of the plan is to expand the rotation a little bit there to keep the minutes down for some of the other guys. And then with, with Dort being out, you've needed to lean on them a little bit more too, but yeah, I mean, Edgem has been good and that's not shocking because I mean, this is coming from like the, that the convener, the deputy of the (laughs) Melvin Edgem 
fan club like from day one I, I could never understand why he didn't get more of an opportunity more of a look i think he was in camp with the hawks one year mm. but um he's, he's in summer been, in my mind an nba caliber player for for a while and and certainly what he brings to canada with his versatility um is is huge and he's been good but like phil scrub looked really good mm-hmm. the other the other night too um Mm-hmm. And you mentioned Kyle Alexander, like they've gotten good minutes from those guys, but maybe more of an obvious answer is, is Kelly. Like I, mm-hmm. I've been really impressed with yeah. Kelly Olynyk, and, and that's not shocking too, because of how consistent mm-hmm. he is and how experienced he is at that level. But I was saying, and I'm not even sure that this is a hot take. It probably isn't, mm-hmm. but I think outside of Shea, he's the most important player oh, for yeah. this team just because of, as I mentioned, the experience and what he brings. And just like, he, he's a really good NBA player, but he's a really, really good FIBA player. And those guys, you see them all, all, all over the place. I mean, Evan Fournier was one for France. Guys that mm-hmm. I think in, in order to be really good at international basketball, at that FIBA level, like there, there is the experience factor because it is so different in a lot of ways that that going through that a bunch of times, I, I think hardens you to a certain degree. But then also like Kelly's just built for it, you know. Like yeah. there's he's there, there's more power to his game than you might think. Like he's not mm-hmm. at all deterred by the physicality that mm-hmm. you see in these FIBA games. But at the same time, there's enough finesse there, obviously, where he steps out. He hits the jump shot, but his playmaking at that four or five spot too is really key for them. So I've been really impressed with him, even in those first halves where they've gotten yeah. off to slow starts and Shea's been really quiet before the Shea explosion. Mm-hmm. It's been Kelly that's Kelly kind of keeping them afloat in, in yeah. the game close enough to eventually strike in the third quarter. No, that's exactly. I was on radio a couple of days ago and I said the exact same thing. In these first quarters against France, against um against Latvia he was really the catalyst just to keep them in the game right to to he'd make a little you know a, a three or a nice little put back or or kind of post up and um really just kept maybe that that lead for the opponent at like seven eight points rather than it ballooning a bit more to 12 15 he got a big block in the Latvia game when again uh Latvia really felt like they could get up to 15 16 point lead and um, in a weird way, I find he's the leader of the team just because he's um, just so consistent, right? And he just, as you said, with the feet, how he plays in FIBA, just he can shoot, he's physical, he likes the dirty stuff. Nothing seems to rattle him at all. No, no, exactly. And he, um, maybe just because of, maybe it's not the same level of NBA athletes, he can survive on defense a bit more. And also just on offense, he can maybe take advantage a bit more against a bit less maybe length and athleticism. So it's just been phenomenal to see him play. And he's just so much fun. Like he just always finds like two back cuts every game to Powell or Brooks or whoever the case may be. But uh, just for you, Josh, what do you think are some of the the concerns you might have with this team going up against higher competition uh, later in this tournament? Well, there, there aren't a lot of, like negative things we could point to at this point, just based on how they've been playing. We talked about obviously the concerns of as you get deeper into the tournament, these games become more important and more must win than they've already been not specific to Canada, but for any of these teams, like it it is scary that one off day can end the tournament for you. So in addition to that, I would just say that like, and, and maybe this is a good thing for Canada because they're not a shooting team. Right. Mm-hmm. Like they're not a team that's going to rely on their shot. So that idea of like, well, what if your your shot just isn't falling one one day? Canada's in a position where they shouldn't have to rely on that anyway. What they're relying on, as we talked about earlier, is their defense, which shouldn't really vary that much from game to game if they're locked in and playing the way that they should be. Um, and then their their ability to get out and transition and attack there, get to the free throw line. I think to me, like that, that, and when even when we look at those first three games, when they've been at their best, it's when they've been doing that. And they have a pretty yeah. good idea, I think a really good idea at this point of what their identity is. The only rough patches of these games that they've had is when they've gotten away from that. And credit to those other teams, like credit to Latvia in the first half of that game, because they fully took Canada out of its comfort zone, right? Like mm-hmm. they weren't 
getting out in transition at all. No, Latvia at was all. taking care of the ball. I think Canada had like one, they, they forced one turnover in the first mm-hmm. half. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that they had any fast break points. They had a couple, but what's interesting yeah. just on that point of getting back to their, their, their identity at the end of that second quarter, they got a couple transition points and then it just, that's when they went on their run. Yeah. Right, I think Shea got a layup. R- RJ, RJ, RJ had, a had a dunk, point. and the the one at the buzzer. So that's interesting yeah. that you say that because it was really that that was the case, Josh. In, just in terms of when they cut that lead back from 10, 12 to to being up at the half somehow was just because they got a couple transition buckets, and it led to everything else. So that's the concern, I guess. Is like if you're Canada and they know this, like you you don't want to be playing half court game some of these other teams do but like yeah I, i'd be a little bit nervous about their half court off and i feel like i'm talking about the raptors here mm-hmm. um, I, I feel a bit nervous if, if they were operating in the half court uh, on a like consistent basis throughout the game because that's not their strength and yeah they've actually been better overall as a shooting team in this tournament so far than a lot of people expected and that i mean some of those numbers are skewed by the lebanon game or second Mm -hmm. half against latvia so i I would say maybe that they've been an inconsistent shooting team to this point with the exception of nikhil uh alexander Alexander. walker who's been hitting hitting everything but yeah that's not if, if you're relying on that at any point then that could be the concern but as long as they find ways to play to their identity and force turnovers and, and generate easy points, find ways to get Shea in open space and get him to his spots in the mid range and, and credit to him. Cause I think like he, he's shooting the three ball too, the step back better than he has in that's good news for OKC as, mm-hmm. as well as Canada. Um, as long as they continue doing those things, then I think they'll be okay. Yeah, no, what's interesting about the half court is and, and just the shooting is against France, they shot it, I believe it was 31% from three. So they didn't have a an RJ missed almost every shot and they still won by 30, right? So this team just has so much depth that one guy going a bit cold, obviously um, they can still definitely uh, recoup or uh, regroup from that. But um, at the same time, I'm like, what what teams outside? Obviously, the U.S. It's it's obvious that's a team that could challenge them. But what other teams do you see in this tournament that could really challenge them? And especially maybe out in the quarters where they could play Slovenia and Australia, yeah. Germany. I'm really high on Germany. I don't know what you how you feel about them, but that's the team I don't want to play. Um, from from that those three. I mean, all three of them are scary for for different reasons. I mean, Australia is really, really solid, but maybe they, they might be the the team of those three that scares me the least. You mentioned mm-hmm. Germany and, and Canada. I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but they obviously have a, a two game sample size of them so far. And I mean, Germany pushed them in in both games really, really hard. It's probably the toughest competition that they've faced in the games that count and the games that that don't count so far up to this point. Um, Dennis Schroeder, good news for the Raptors. This looked really, really good. So yeah, Ger- Germany's tough. And then Slovenia is tough. If for no other reason, then we talked about the Shea factor and like what a difference it makes to have the best player on the floor, which Canada is going to have in this tournament in almost every single game that they play, except for a game against Slovenia. So that, that scares me too, because Luca kid, when mm-hmm. a, a game, especially a, a single game Someone. knockout situation, he, he could win that single handedly. No, for sure. I, they, they, just for people that don't know, like they are missing. They obviously Vladko Chanchar blew. I think it was his ACL. So they, they're missing. They and they're missing a couple guys that were really a big part of their their run at the Olympics, where they finished fourth. So I don't think the Slovenia team's as good. They haven't looked as good during the. The, the group stage although they won all their games but not against the toughest opponents but at the same time as you said uh i just watching luca in the nba it just gives me fear every single time uh i think canada if lou dort's healthy with brooks they have almost ideal people to guard him as best as you can right um what do, what do you think because a lot of people and i, I won't keep you too too long but what do you make of people now that are talking about the Shea versus Luca debate as like who's better? Like, do you think it's clearly Luca? Do you think it's pretty close? What do you make of that debate? I think it's close. I, I think it's still Luca. Um, but 
the fact that it's even close again speaks to how far Shea has come in a very short period of time because I mean Luca is a perennial MVP candidate one of the very best players in the NBA like we're talking top I mean I was gonna say top five but that's like that's not a hot take top Mm -hmm. three yeah and and Shea is is right there I I, I mean I think it's Luca but Mm -hmm. I mean maybe the fact that and I don't think that Shea is like an exceptional defender, but Shea is definitely a better defender than Luca. That that probably gives him a bit of an edge in that mm-hmm. in that debate. Um, I think it's close, but I, I think Shea's probably number two. Yeah. No, no. I, I mean it's really pick your poison, but Luca's such a good passer and that probably yeah. outweighs his defensive um inefficiencies compared to Shea, who's maybe what would you say, like a okay to good defender. And I yeah. mean, he gets a lot of steals, which is interesting. He he loves the the rip through or the the like the guys dribbling past him, and he just pokes it by him with his long arms. But yeah, I I think I tend to agree with you, even though my heart says Shea. Um, but uh, he's just not the playmaker that that Luca is. So okay, Josh, I've I've taken enough of your time. Um, I just want to give you the floor and say, uh, how confident are you? Just or or what's your maybe prediction? If I had to make you put a wager on it where Canada goes. I mean, it's all, it's a two pronged one in terms of Olympics and, and just the tournament itself, but how far do you think they get in this tournament and and maybe why? Yeah. I I mean, it's really tough to predict in terms of like the tournament itself for all the reasons we talked about. I I mean, once it gets into the knockout stage, it's so tough to kind of predict where things are going to go and you don't know the matchups necessarily. And there's so many good teams in this tournament can they medal? Absolutely. Like they're, mm-hmm. they're good enough to do it. I think they're capable of doing it. I think if you're looking at like Olympic qualification, that's a little bit easier to foresee just because we know the teams that they've got to outlast. Again, it's a little bit tricky because I mean, Dominican has a, a way easier path. They got a way friendlier draw than Canada way does. Easier. And we're yeah. still seeing it, right? Like, I mean, Things have kind of broke since since the draw where I said where I would say Canada got very unlucky. They've been pretty fortunate in that no Porzingis for Latvia, no Wemby for France. Then obviously France um, is upset in the first round, so things have sort of worked out pretty well for them to this point. But we talked about it. I mean, even if you look at their next crossover group, where you could be looking at one of those three teams we talked about, three really tough teams. Um, yeah, it's not an easy path. And the fact that Dominican maybe has an easier path makes it tough. But yeah, I I mean, I think at minimum, my expectation, my prediction would be that Canada qualifies for the Olympics as the second best team in that America's group, with all due respect to Carl Anthony Towns and that Dominican team that's playing really well. And then yeah, I mean, I'm not sure they win the tournament, but I, I think that they can medal for sure. Mm-hmm. No, for sure. Um, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, I, I think the three best teams in the in this World Cup are Canada, USA, and Germany. Maybe that's I'm just maybe those two games just scarred me or something. I'm not sure. But uh, uh, and the thing is, if Canada plays Germany, I don't know how I feel about them. And and Franz yeah. Wagner is actually I don't know if it's reported, but what I've heard from people in Okinawa is that he's out for the rest of the second round. So that might impact one Germany seeding, seeding, although they beat Australia and also just, um, just he, he, his first game would probably be against Canada in the quarters, which would be uh, a tough way to get acclimated after a bad uh, ankle injury. Um, So it's going to be, it's going to be really fun. And uh, I think I'm sure we're both set that they're going to make the quarterfinals. I feel that's pretty, uh, I'm not, I'm not, there's people that are, are, me? I haven't, I haven't I haven't done all of the math yet and it's it's a little bit complicated just with the rules of the tournament but I'm pretty sure if they if they beat Brazil they're yeah, they're if, pretty much if, yeah. if they beat Brazil um it would be on point differential between them and Latvia like basically Latvia w- and Brazil would be the only teams that could uh no Brazil would be out and then Latvia would be the tiebreaker and they'd have the win so uh, actually I, I believe if they beat Brazil, they lock it in actually, because um, they have yeah. the tiebreaker versus Latvia. Um, unless and then they would have the unless what's the what's the actually actually if Spain I... were to lose if Spain were to lose it'd be point differential, but because Canada beat um, Latvia by so much, 
Um, if it was a three-way tie, if Canada basically didn't lose by too many points against Spain, they should be okay. So it's an unofficial official. But if, let's say, Latvia were to lose to Spain in the early game and Canada beats Brazil, they'd make it to the quarters. That's the easiest way to think about it, which is probably the most likeliest scenario. Let's hope that's the case just for math and <laughs> doing point differential and 50 scenarios and all that. Amazing what a difference a win makes, right? Because, like, they lose that game against Latvia, and, like, oh. quarterfinals would have been really, really tough. They go into the group, then it would have, they would have been third in the mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. in a group that only two teams can come out of, and the Latvia would have the tiebreaker with Canada. Yep. Yep. And that Spain game would have essentially been must-win. Whereas yeah, now, it... like you said, a win against Brazil and that Spain game might not mean much other than for seeding going into the quarterfinals. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so exactly. You you said it perfectly. Um, thanks so much, Josh, for, for taking the time and doing this. Anything you want to plug at TSN before I let you go? Um. Not really. Follow me on Twitter or X or whatever it's called until yeah. it doesn't exist anymore at JLU1050. Um, taking a little bit of time off um, after the World Cup until the Raptor season starts up again and then back to work. Well, Hopefully I love covering a better team than I did last year. Yeah, well, we'll see. I don't know. I feel there's going to be in a way almost more questions, which I didn't think was possible yeah. after last year, but uh, it's definitely going in that direction. But uh, thanks so much, Josh, for for doing this. I, I love your work. Everyone should check you out on on X and at uh, and at TSN. And I really appreciate you taking the time uh, today on this podcast. Thanks, Alex. Anytime, man.